So um, let's just uh, take a moment to please pray and then we will get started. Um, Monica, would you be able to please uh, just pray and consecrate this time to the Lord? Yes, Pastor. Let me pray. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father. We give you praise. We give you thanks for the day that you have given us. Thanking you, giving a new life today uh, to concentrate on you, to uh, read your words, to know the fact that uh, you are doing your grace is with us, Lord. Thanking you, Father. For being with us from few months, few uh, years, Lord. Thanking you, Lord, for everything that you have given us, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord the Father, as uh, we start the day with mentoring our Lord the Father, being with us, Lord. As whatever we uh, discuss here, the questions will come up, Lord the Father. Help us to understand. Help us to um know uh, about your kingdom more lord lord help us uh, give us the wisdom and knowledge lord father god let uh, each of us i uh, submit each of us into your almighty hand lord the father let you lead everyone wherever they are in which area they are working in which area they are growing in their knowledge lord the father help us to grow with um, your knowledge and whatever you um, you have planned for us, Lord the Father, whatever your purpose uh, for us, Lord the Father, Father, uh, lead us to complete it, lead us to fulfill for the kingdom, Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you, Father God. I pray this prayer in your name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, connecting. To this call. Um, we uh, just leave this time open uh, so that um, we can interact. Uh, those who want to ask questions, uh, welcome to ask questions or if there's something you want to share, uh, you're welcome to um, share. Um, so yeah, the time is open. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions and uh, or if you want to clarify some things, uh, or share some things, you're welcome to do that. All right, Charles, you want to, Charles, uh, you want to get us started? You want to ask your question? No, uh, I'm happy for the morning. It is still 5.30 here in Africa, in Uganda. Uh, but uh, Sorry, Charles? I don't have a can you hear me? Okay, now it's better, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't have a question. I have come to listen. Okay, good, good. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so we have a question uh, on the chat from John Paul. How does the Bible interpret taking vows? Could you explain how the vow Paul took it in Kyria in the Book of Acts? Yeah, so... Um, the you know uh, making vows we see we, we see that in in the Old Testament um, uh, and uh, you know the book of Ecclesiastes says you know if you make a vow make sure you keep it now I'm just referring to the Old Testament uh, understanding of this um, but so let me just give you that scripture here I'm just turning my Bible. Um, um, uh, where is this here? Um, you know, I can't, um, I can't just, uh, uh, uh five, five, five is it? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, at least this is five, five, right? So, the, uh, the, uh, the Old Testament understanding was, you know, you you make a promise, you make a, a vow by something higher and bigger than you, uh, as though they're going to hold you responsible, or making a vow to God as a pledge, uh, almost like 
you know, God, you do this and I will do this kind of thing. And we see that, we see examples of that in the Old Testament. Perhaps one of the most saddest of those cases is that of Jephthah when he says, he makes a vow to God that, you know, if God blesses him in his, uh, uh, in his engagement, his fight, the first thing he sees, you know, he will offer to God. And when he goes back home, he sees his daughter coming, running out. So uh, all of those things, you know, uh, we see in the Old Testament. But when we come to the New Testament, I think uh, it's in Matthew 5, when Jesus teaches us, he says, don't say anything at all. This is Matthew 5, uh, verse um, 33. Uh, you know, don't swear. Uh, uh, let you, uh, verse 33 to 37. Yeah? Let you yes be yes, and you know we know. So in the New Testament, the instruction is don't even bother to do this. Uh, whether you're doing it on an earthly level or even with God, don't do this, right? It's it's not needed. And we do not engage with God on the basis of uh, the Old Testament understanding. Uh, so the New Testament, the, the relationship with God in the New Testament has been changed. It is something that's completely free. Uh, it's based on... Uh, uh, the freedom that we have in Christ, uh, the freedom that we have through what Christ has done for us. Now, if somebody wants to do something, uh, that's entirely their choice, right? So if somebody says, God, uh, and there are people who do that these days. Uh, if you even hear of, uh, you know, famous preachers or ministers who do some things like this, they may say, you know, uh, every week, two days a week, I will fast. So that's a commitment they've made between them and God or things like that. So you find something similar in Paul's case uh, where, you know, on his, um, towards the end of his third missionary journey, he determines to go to Jerusalem. Uh, of course, he is going back to Jerusalem with uh, carrying, yeah, I hope I'm not mixed this up, but uh, he's uh, he's carrying uh, 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 the offering back to Judea to the people in Judea. They're going through difficulties. Uh, they're going through um, uh, you know the time of famine and so on. So he's bringing aid back to Jerusalem. So that's part of his mission in returning back to Jerusalem towards the end of his third missionary journey. And another thing that also Paul is trying to do in his third missionary journey is he's trying to so you know paul was in a very difficult situation he was a jew he's preaching christ he's an apostle to the gentiles but now the jewish christians are questioning paul you know where are you and you find this in in, in the early church is a big problem study you know and, and so they had even the jerusalem council in acts 15 trying to decide what to do uh, then subsequently, there is another situation where uh, Peter plays a double game, the Apostle Peter, right? When he meets the Gentiles, he sits and eats with the Gentiles. When the Jews come, he withdraws from the Gentiles. And so Paul rebukes Peter about that double standard that he was demonstrating. So uh, you can imagine the apostles are actually going through a problem. That is, uh, they are originally Jews. Now they're mingling with Gentiles because they're preaching the gospel. But technically, Jews don't mingle with Gentiles like this. But they're, you know, they're going through this whole transition period. So Paul is also in a similar situation, and he he makes certain decisions. You know, for example, he circumcises Timothy. He has Titus uh, with him, uh, who was also a, a convert, uh, Christian a convert, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of these dynamics going on. So one of his intentions, the second intention when he goes back to Jerusalem is to kind of demonstrate to the Jews that uh, he's not against, uh, you know, in, in some way, you know, he's trying to demonstrate to them that uh, he's still connected with the Jewish people. He loves them. And he expresses this in, in even in Romans 9. So one of the things he wants to do is he wants to go back to Jerusalem and he wants to keep a vow. He wants to demonstrate in Jerusalem to the community that uh, he still honors the faith of his fathers. And that's why he says, you know, I'm going to go and give my hair, basically shave myself in Jerusalem, making a vow 
it's a demonstrate and it's an act of demonstration showing that he's still honoring uh, the fathers. But that is the thing that really gets him into trouble. Because as soon as he goes back to Jerusalem and he walks into the temple in order to keep his vow, the Jew, that, just that very thing gets him in trouble. The Jews turn against him. They catch him. And from then on, it's a big journey of trouble for Paul because they catch him. Uh, then you know they, uh, they, they bring him to court. Then for two years, he's kept under house arrest in Caesarea. And there he appeals to Caesar. <clears throat> then after two years from Caesarea, he makes the journey to Rome. So, so if you ask, you know, what was the motivation of Paul keeping this vow? Uh, it's not something, you know, uh, some big thing as, as tr him trying to relate to God, but more so as an act of trying to appease the Jewish people, the Jewish community, that he on, still honors the faith of his fathers. And you can see, you know, and, and you can see some of this that comes out in his writing, for instance, in Romans uh, chapter 10, you know, he says, you know, Romans 10, 1 and 2, he says, you know, I, I want a prayer that Israel will be saved. So although he's an apostle to the Gentiles, his heart is for the Jewish people also. And this is one of the things he's doing, trying to show that he still honors that. So that's the motivation behind Paul's, you know, uh, going to Jerusalem, taking a vow, shaving his hair, and so on and so forth. But in the New Testament, to answer your question, in the New Testament, we don't need to do it. If people of their own choice want to do it, it's between them and God. But there's no need to do it. We, we, our relationship with God is something that's of the spirit, where there is liberty rather than, you know, uh, what you do, what you don't do and touch and taste. And we read about that. Um, it's actually coming up in uh, the uh, sermon of In Christ, In Christ series sermon on the, the 12th of September. We get into all those scriptures about the liberty that we have in Christ. Um, uh, but I will uh, just, you know, mention this scripture here in, uh, actually there are several scriptures, but uh, if you look at Galatians 6, uh, I just quickly mentioned this one here. Uh, sorry, Galatians 4, Paul himself writes, you know, uh, why do you, <clears throat> so Galatians 4, 9 and 10, why do you submit yourself to weak and beggarly ailments? You observe days, months, seasons, and years. Uh, yeah, and also in Colossians, uh, he talks about, uh, don't do this, don't do that. That's Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Uh, what you drink, keeping days, observing things. So he said, you know, don't, our, our, our life in Christ is completely free. So I hope I answered your question, John. Uh, Try to put a lot of stuff together in a few minutes. But, okay. okay. Zelatoli, what's the Bible take on doing good works? How to explain to someone who thinks doing good works will save them? All right. Um, I'll let Pastor Jacobar <clears throat> answer this one from Zelatoli on Good Works, please. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, so, um, doing good works, uh, definitely, we are as believers, we are we are exhorted to um, you know do good works, and th these works are um, uh, actually draw people to. To the Father, uh, we are to keep them. Um, however, um, good works come out of our faith. Um, it's uh, faith is central, and good works flow out of that. And good works don't uh, save people. And uh, I think um, Ephesians chapter two is very clear. Chapter two and verses um, eight and nine are very clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's um, in Ephesians two eight and nine, very clear that we have been saved by grace, saved through faith um, in in Christ, and um, it's not by works. So that's you know very clear. Um, so I think people want to look for. Uh, evidence of works in the sense you know people are saying that okay I have faith and there's no good works following right so maybe that's why um, some people you know say you know you need to have good works well the Bible does say that we need to have good works um, you know uh, like if you look at James chapter 2 and verse um, 17 
um, says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Right? And uh, 17 to 26, James actually explains about how faith um, needs to uh, you know, lead to good works or acts of uh, the works of faith. Right? And uh, in verse 26, uh, it says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So, um, so we see the, uh, the connection between faith and works. Right? So, um, oh, when it comes to salvation, right? When we, uh, uh, when it comes to salvation, it is by faith in Christ, and it is the grace of God. It is definitely not by performance, not by any works. And Ephesians two is a is a scripture that you can point to people. Thank you. Okay. Is that okay, Silatoli? So any, uh, do you have a follow-up question? You're fine with that. Okay, thank you so much, pastors. Um, like, uh, you know, one of my friends said, you know, all the Hindus, the Muslims, they do good works, you know. Why I try to explain to him that uh, good works will save, uh, save them, but he did not agree on that point. So how would I explain to him clearly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, we can use the scripture, uh, and you probably already know this, Isaiah 64, verse 6, right? It says, all our righteousness, all our good works, right, are like Isaiah 64, verse 6, all our good works uh, are like filthy rags. So that's one thing. That means uh, we do good works, but our good works in the sight of a holy God are just um, still un unacceptable. Why? Many times our motivation is in question, right? For example, and, and we're not, we not discrediting good works, but in the context of your question, right, about being saved through good works. So... Uh, um, so, um, our motivation many times our motivations are wrong, right? So, sometimes people do good works so that they may be seen by others. Sometimes people do good works as though they are trying to bargain with God. Yesterday I did five wrong, so today I'll do six good. You know, uh, so the motivation is not real to help somebody. So I, they may be, you know, they may be giving food to six people. But they're actually that giving food is a bargain with God, you know. So the, there is a you know misplaced motivation. So Isaiah 64 verse six: All our righteousness are like filthy rags. One. Second is to understand the uh, understand how God sees sin. How does God see our good works? Isaiah 64 verse six: How does God see sin? Right. Romans 6:23. We know this: The wages of sin is death. That means. Even if I do one wrong, the only way I can account for that before God is I have to be separated from God eternally. One sin, one sin is enough. No amount of good works can account for that one sin. Why? Because God is absolutely holy. Absolutely holy. And even one sin makes me a sinner before God. That means I am one sin disqualifies me from standing in the presence of God, period. You can put it like this. Suppose I have a white shirt and, uh, you know, I just uh, have one dot, one black dot. It's a perfectly white shirt. But the moment I have one black dot, that, that perfection, that clean cleanliness of that white shirt is gone. Only one dot. The rest of the shirt is white. Very white, <laughs> but one dot, it mars that whiteness. It disqualifies that perfection, right? So that's the position of every person before God. And the Bible is very clear that the result of sin is death, which means I have to die. I have to be separated from God eternally in hell to pay for that one sin. And no amount of good works can substitute for that. So uh, 
you know, so the way to present it is God is absolutely holy. Even a small imper imperfection disqualifies us from standing or being in his presence. Right? So on the basis of this, there's only one way to salvation. It is an imperfect, a perfect one paying the penalty for our imperfections. And there could be only one perfect one, which is when God became a man. No man could rise to that level of perfection you know, th through any amount of works, through penance, through prayers, through pilgrimages. No person could rise to that level of absolute perfection. The only one who could be absolutely perfect is if God became a man and he being a sinless one could then become the substitute for the sinful one and pay our price. So that's where the redemption comes in. Does that help in explaining? Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's um, look at the next question. All right. Diana's question. Um, Nancy, would you like to take up Diana's question? Uh, maybe you could read it. And uh, Yes. Yes, Pastor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diana, for the question. So Diana um, writes, I have heard several definitions of binding and losing, uh, especially in the context uh, with binding spirits. When we bind and cast out, where do these spirits go? Also, what does this verse mean in context with binding and losing? Matthew 16, verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dinah. Um, I'll try and share uh, my thoughts. So, uh, yes, so binding and losing. Uh, yes, we do see a lot of that uh, in the context of binding spirits. Uh, and by mm, binding uh, spirits or uh, you know losing what we are actually doing is we're exercising our spiritual authority so that's that's what we're doing uh, uh, and uh, when we talk about spirits or uh, demonic spirits they're basically disembodied um, being spirits uh, so we we cast them out of people or if they are influencing uh, a particular situation you know basically we are uh, disallowing them from uh, uh, sort of engaging in that situation or circumstance when we use our authority. So uh, th that's what uh, you know we're doing when either we uh, release the command of, uh, uh, you know, I bind the spirit of strife. You might want to say that if, let's uh, say, just for example, if uh, there's <laughs> there's strife uh, in the house and you uh, sense that uh, that could be a demonic influence, so you would use your spiritual authority and say, and bind that spirit of strife in the name of Jesus, right? So then you are disallowing that spirit to influence. Uh, and then, yes, of course, you know, with, with our wisdom and uh, our responsibility, we would also need to do whatever needs to be done in order to, to uh, bring peace in the situation in addition to the praying and taking authority. And when we uh, uh, disallow spirits or disengage spirits from circumstances or in the case of casting out demon spirits, we see Jesus do that. Um, uh, what uh, we see in scripture is that these spirits, uh, where do these spirits go? You know, they're still around. They're still around and they're looking for a host you know, because uh, they want a space to dwell in. They want a living space, which uh, we know that they dwell in, uh, uh, they, they could... Uh, live in humans or they could um, uh, dwell in animals or objects spaces so they're trying to find uh, find a dwelling place okay and uh, obviously we also know that uh, believers right believers we have the holy spirit living on the inside of us and you know um, uh, so uh, these spirits you know they they cannot uh, come and possess a believer now coming to uh, the question that you've asked here about what does the verse mean in the context uh, of binding and losing? Uh, uh, here, what um, Jesus was saying is, because he has given us the authority of the kingdom, what we can do is we can release, we can release the, uh, the works of heaven here on earth. So when we are losing 
uh, heaven on earth it means you know the joy the peace whatever is part of the kingdom of heaven uh, with our authority we are able to release that here on earth uh, and similarly when we uh, we say something like we bind on earth right we bind on earth what is bound in heaven now we see in heaven there's no sin there's no interference of satan um you know there's there's no works of darkness over there so when we when we see that in heaven we can use our authority and say okay anything that qualifies as the work of the enemy uh, in my life i bind that uh, in the name of jesus so basically you're binding the things that don't exist in heaven right because uh, you but that we want to see heaven here on earth and jesus has given us the keys of the kingdom or the authority of the kingdom to release heaven in our midst so i, I think uh, i uh, will leave it at that pastor if there's any any yeah. more thoughts yeah that's yeah. good thank that's you good. Yeah, so the scripture that you were referring to was uh, Matthew twelve forty four. So basically, uh, you know, to say to sum up what Nancy was saying uh, uh, today, we don't have authority to send spirits to hell. You know, we don't do that. Otherwise, by now the church would have sent all the spirits to hell and cleared up earth, but we don't do that, right? And we expel spirits out of a person or out of a situation. They wander around through dry places, Matthew twelve forty three, but then they look, keep looking for opportunities to interfere. And so this is an ongoing struggle. When things will happen is when they will be cleared out of earth is in Revelation 20, right? When Jesus comes, Satan is bound for a thousand years, Revelation 20 verse four. Uh, and then at the end of the thousand years, they are dealt with forever, Revelation 20 verse 15. But till then, you know, the battle continues. And like uh, Nancy explained, it's, uh, it's our ex binding and losing as, you know, it's like a policeman, stop, allow, disallow. So that's the authority he's given us on the earth, in dealing with people and situations and so on. Is that okay, Diana? Any follow-up questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. All right. So next one is from Parambir about uh, covenant relationship. Um, so. Uh, so the covenant relationship, you know, like we see between people in the Old Testament, uh, we don't practice that today in the New Testament. We don't do that. It's not something the Bible tells us to do. It's just a yes and a no. So Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. So we don't practice those kind of relationships. But what the Bible does teach us is, uh, and I'm referencing 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, Corinthians 10, 16 to 17, is that all of us in the body of Christ are in covenant relationship with each other because we partake of, we are part of the covenant that we have with Almighty God. So Paul explains that, you know, when we drink the cup, it's a fellowship, it's a communion with everybody else in the body of Christ. And when we eat the bread, it's a communion with everybody else in the body of Christ. So in that sense, as believers, we are in covenant, not only with God, but also with each other. But it's not the same as, you know, like the covenant that people made with each other in the Old Testament. So that's important. So to answer your question, we don't do that. We don't practice that in the New Testament. Now, there are some misapplications of the Old Testament today in the church. So typically if the scenario that you find is a pastor telling people to be in covenant with him. Uh, I feel that's more of a control strategy rather than any spiritual meaning. So he says, you are in covenant with me. So you have to only come and worship here. Uh, you only have to, you know, pray at this altar. You only have to give money to this altar. It is a control strategy, not a genuine covenant before God. You don't find that in the New Testament. Um, but a lot of believers don't understand it. So they say, I'm, I'm, I'm in covenant with this man of God. Uh, I will give my money here. I will pray at this altar and this man of God covers me. It's not a New Testament teaching. It's a misapplication of Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, uh, co human re covenant relationship. In the New Testament, all of us believers are in one covenant relationship. It's with the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood, the new covenant. And that covenant puts us in a relationship with each other because we eat the same bread and drink the same cup. To that extent, we are in 
fellowship. The purpose of covenant is fellowship. So even on human terms, we fellowship with everyone else in the body of Christ. But to extend that and you know mis misapply it uh, as a control strategy, whether from a pastor to a congregation or between people, uh, it's a misapplication of uh, covenant relationships. Does that help, Varimir? Uh, yeah, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Uh, so, Latali, uh, Charles. So, for the good works to be meaningful, one has to be a child of God. Yes, Charles. Because we are righteous, then what we do becomes works of righteousness. We go from being darkness to light. So, then what we do becomes works of light. The people are able to see uh, our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Okay. Uh, Jordan, it's not all the one sin and we are separate from God. So does it mean we are eternally separated from God or can we go back? Like God's love, it says the Father is one mankind. This sins. All right. So there's somebody who uh, would like to just quickly explain salvation here to Jordan's question. Um, who wants to take this up? Let's see now. Jane, do you want to take this up? A uh, question from Jordan. Uh, so he's talking about uh, in the e-learning, God's love. That's, he's talking about foundations course, chapter two, of the love of God. And so I think it's just a simple understanding of uh, salvation, what it is. Would you like to share that with Jordan, please? Um, first, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Was it, uh, was it just that if uh, with one sin, would they be eternally separated from God? Mm, mm. And could they go back? Mm. Okay. Yeah, so I think we need to differentiate between the state of a sinner and state of a believer. I mean, a believer sins, you know, maybe a simple explanation on that would help. Okay, I'll try my best to do this. Um, yeah, so um, Jordan, uh, so you know, as scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, salvation comes from the name of Jesus Christ alone. So when we confess, as it says in uh, Romans 10 verse 9, when we confess our sins, believe um, that Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, we will be saved. So that's, that is the root of salvation, where we acknowledge that we are sinners, come to a place of repentance, and come to uh, believe that uh, salvation comes only because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And through that forgiveness, we are set free. So that's uh, our root of salvation. Now, when there is, when there is a sinner who continues to sin, does not come to a place of repentance, uh, uh, th there needs to be salvation that should, uh, you know, that, that should come by. But if it is a believer who, who comes back to a place of sinfulness, um, there is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that God opens up for us the ability to go back in, in repentance, uh, again, over again, seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to walk through um, uh, through a, a path of righteousness. Uh, and another thing that we do also understand is not just by, by the power of the cross, it's just not uh, the forgiveness of sin, but also the power of sin over us that has been disarmed and that has been destroyed. So uh, when, and that's, that's the finished work of God uh, on, on the cross. So the more that we uh, believe and stand in appropriation of the, that truth over us um, and, and seek the presence of the Holy Spirit to, to help us, to aid us through temptations, um, because it, it also says that, you know, no temptation um, uh, that, that is, that is, there is you, you know, no temp, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get the right verse. If someone could help me with that verse. Mm. Uh, no, um, First Corinthians 10, 13. There's no temptation overtaken yes, you. Yes, mm. overtaken. Yes, yes. The, that's, Except that's what the is common to man. Common but to God, man. But God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with yes. the temptation, make a way of escape. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So, um, so with with that, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to overcome sin with um, understanding these truths that that the cross has taken away, disarmed the power and the hold of sin over us, and uh, um, that that we walk in righteousness because of what He's done for us on the cross. Yes, Pastor. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Jordan, does it answer your question? Do you have a follow-up or is it clear? Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see now. I have a follow-up. Okay, go ahead, Charles. Charles, go ahead. I have put it in the chat in the, from Hebrews chapter 6. Mm. Can you see it? Yes, yes, yes. That would be my follow-up. How would how would that correspond with what our brother was asking? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So um, who would like to handle this? Um, Jacob, would you want to handle it? This is Hebrews six four and six. Yeah. Um, thanks, Master. So it's talking about. Um, Hebrews 6 is, um, his, uh, Paul is actually, I mean, sorry, the writer of Hebrews is uh, um, encouraging the believers. Um, and uh, here we see that um, uh, encouraging believers to actually, you know, uh, le leave the elementary discussions, principles of Christ and go on to perfection. And, and even before that, you know, he's talking about going on to maturity, solid food and all that. So, um, so he's uh, talking about how, um, uh, this particular verse is saying, oh, you know, ones who are enlightened, meaning that ones you are believers, you're walking in uh, the power of the Spirit, uh, and they've tasted the good word of God and powers of age to come. So if they fall away, uh, to renew them to uh, repentance. And uh, he also finishes by saying, um, you know, uh, he, and he also describes, you know, in verse 7, the earth which drinks in the rain and uh, bears, herb, uh, bears herbs useful for those cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and, and the end is to be burned and all that. And verse 9, he says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So he's really warning the uh, believer and he's saying, you know, uh, so you've been like the earth that is receiving the good rain um, and, uh, you know, the expectation is that the, the that the ground will uh, will be cultivated and it will bear fruit. It will bear herbs useful uh, for mankind. So that is the expectation, and and you have you know really experienced the power of God. You experienced the word of God, and um, and so the outcome is that you walk in fruitfulness and and be a blessing and so on. Um, but if if a person rejects, if a person uh, falls away. You know, willfully saying that I'm I'm rejecting all this. I'm you know falling away willfully. Then it is difficult because um, unless that person then you know himself or herself uh, comes back or comes to himself or herself and repents uh, and comes back, you know. So it it is it is going to be difficult if they willingly walk away from all that. Um, so uh, so that is the warning uh, that. Uh, the writer of Hebrews gives here. Um, but, you know, verse 9 is the encouragement where he says, you know, we are confident of better things uh, concerning you, uh, better things concerning salvation. So in the light of um, uh, the, the context which, uh, you know, uh, which Jordan shared, um, yeah, is it possible to walk away from God? Is it possible to reject? Um, well, uh, you know, humanly, we know that it is possible. You can reject everything, but um, you and I cannot ascertain. You know, has that person lost salvation? You know, has that person lost their, uh, uh, you know, their destiny with God? Uh, is that person destined? We 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 cannot really make that, um, you know, make that statement or come to that conclusion because we know that. God is able to save to the uttermost, and once a person repents, um, uh, you know, that uh, forgiveness is available even for such a person. So, yeah, I would just respond uh, that manner. Yeah. Charles, yeah, Pastor. Charles, you uh, is that clear? 
right? So uh, just to kind of sum it up, uh, the Bible does, you know, like what Pastor said, saying, there is a line that you cross where a person, a believer can cross and then it, it this applies, you know, it's impossible to get them back. But uh, we don't know, you know, who has crossed that line. We don't know if anyone has crossed the line. So like what Pastor Chikma said, we are not going to judge people. Uh, from our side, we are also always going to believe that, you know, God will save them. We're going to do what we can to reach them. We talk about believers who are, you know, wandering away from the faith. It's, we leave that to God. You know, that is not for us to decide. But we know that's possible, yeah. Uh, a person who was once a believer may wander away from the faith. And um, Paul actually repeats the same thing in Hebrew. Uh, I'm not saying Paul, the writer of Hebrews. Uh, he repeats the same thing in Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, you know. God says, if anyone draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Uh, but he says, we are not of the perdition. Who, we are not of those who draw back to perdition. It means their eternal destruction. So that's possible, but we let God handle it. You know, our, our, our goal is to believe the best and pray for people and, you know, do that. Okay. Good. Um, any other questions, please? How about, how are you? Okay, I'm not sure. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions coming, so um, let's take some time just to uh, Abhishek. Ephesians 1, verse 10. Um, Roshan, you would like to take this up? Question from uh, Abhishek. Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 10. Please. I'm not sure if it's this. You're doing okay, Russian? You're fine. I'm doing okay. Yes. Thank you. So, um, the verse says to be to be put into effect when the times uh, reach their fulfillment, to bring a unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Uh, like, from my understanding, uh, Paul mentions um, like the fullness of time, um, referring to uh, just the right time or God's perfect timing. Uh, and I think he also uses that language in uh, Galatians chapter 4, uh, I think verse 4, I'm not sure. Uh, nothing, uh, it says like, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Um, so he's just emphasizing on God's uh, perfect timing. And also another thing, uh, like a recurring theme uh, in Paul's letters is um, the concept or the, um, not the concept, um, his uh, heart for unity, uh, you, know, you know, unity amongst amongst believers and, and saints and whatnot. So um, that's what I get off it. Um, so, the fullness of time simply is pointing out to God's perfect timing. And um, once again, um, I mean, it's Paul's heart for unity among saints. Um, that's all I could gather for now. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so Paul, yeah, I'll just uh, continue from where Roshan Rosh shared. Um, yeah. So he's talking about Paul is unveiling the mystery of God's plan, right? Of what has God planned for the ages. So there are things that God has already fulfilled that have been fulfilled, but are things that are kept for the future. So verse 10 and, uh, you know, uh, uh, is talking about those, that which is, that God is going to do this. What's he going to do? In the, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather together in one, right? 
So you find, you know, so when, when, when you, you, know, you want to understand, okay, what is he talking about? Well, uh, you find, uh, you know, you look at a lot of other references of Paul talking about the same thing. For instance, uh, he talks about, um, you know, uh, in chapter 2 uh, and verse uh, 15, uh, that uh, uh, in Christ, you know, he's brought the Jew and Gentile and he makes one new man. Right? So that's one aspect of gathering all together in Christ. That means Jew and Gentile are gathering together in Christ. Right? Then he also talks about you know, all who are one in heaven and on earth. So this is repeated in chapter 3. Right? And he talks about this. You know, he says, Abba, my knees to the Father. Uh, verse 15, Ephesians 3. The whole family in heaven and earth. That means there are saints who are in heaven. There are saints who are on earth. He's going to gather us all together in one, right? Ephesians 3.15. You also find Paul using the same thing in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 that he's, he repeats this. He says uh, um, uh, that through the redemption that he has, not verse 15, sorry, Colossians 1 verse 20. Colossians 1 verse 20. So through the redemption that's in Christ, what's, what's, going, to, what's he going to do? He's going to reconcile all things to Christ, uh, to the Father, through Christ. That means he's going to bring all this back. So if you trace Paul's unveiling of the mystery, he's basically saying time is coming when everything will be brought back to the Father through Christ. Right? Jew and Gentile, those are saints who are in heaven, saints who are on earth, and everything that's been lost will be brought back to Christ. Now you find this very interesting, even in Peter's sermon in Acts 3.21, right? that he says, uh, the heavens must retain Christ until he comes and verse 21 acts 3 the restoration of all things takes place so again peter himself is preaching this right so what we are understanding in the unveiling of the mystery is the time will come everything will be through christ will be reconciled when will this happen in the fullness of time so what he's really referring to is uh, when you go back when you go into revelation and uh, we, we already uh, referenced this over in revelation uh, 20, when everything is, you know, uh, put down and all things are restored back to the Father. And that's like the grand culmination of everything. Uh, but th this is what in Ephesians 1.10, Paul is, you know, having a, uh, a preview of that, that, you know, in the, this, in the fullness of times, everything will be brought back to the Father. Uh, you know, uh, saints who are in heaven, saints who are on earth, they'll all be brought together, Jew and Gentile. Everyone will be restored to the Father. Is that okay, Abhishek? So that's what he's referring to. Okay. Okay, we've got two minutes. We're going to close in prayer. Um, and uh, we will dismiss. Thank you, each one, for being part of the call today. We've uh, had some interesting questions. So it helps us um, also learn as we. Uh, you know, uh, uh, receive your questions and it helps make us think um, and uh, and uh, respond to these questions. So it's a very helpful time uh, for all of us. Okay, uh, let me see. I'll just uh, invite somebody to please uh, close in prayer and uh, dismiss us. How about, um, all right, let me ask uh, uh, Dave. Dave, would you close and dismiss us in prayer, please? Sure. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Lord God. Thank you for the, this session, Lord Jesus, this mentoring session. Thank you, God, that you are so wonderful. You have been so uh, gracious that, Lord Jesus, you have helped us to learn from so um, well-established and uh, and so experience children of God, Lord Jesus, that we can learn from them, Lord God. We thank you that uh, in the upcoming days, Lord Jesus, I pray that your favor and your grace be upon uh, APC, Lord Jesus, and the whole ministry and and everything that they are doing, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this session. And as we move ahead for other things, Lord Jesus, bless us, Lord, bless each spirit and bless each lecture, Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be part of the call today. I uh, appreciate it.
Uh, we will take a break and.